You're listening to The Gutsy Podcast, where we talk about all things real, raw, and ridiculous about running a business authentically. Whether you need an inspirational pick-me-up or a swift kick in the mental ass, The Gutsy Podcast is your bi-weekly guide to getting out of your head and back into action. I'm Laura Ora, branding and mindset coach for female entrepreneurs, CEO of Works & Co., and your host on this journey through entrepreneurship. It's time to fuel your gutsy. Hey, hey, gutsy peeps. Welcome to a very, very special gutsy exclusive. You know, so many times in our life, we want to show up in our lives and in our businesses, but ultimately we fear what other people might think and say about us. This is causing you to stay small and give you perceived safety, but ultimately it's pulling you further and further away from your calling. In this Gutsy Podcast exclusive, we're talking to Sean Hunter, also known as hashtag Peloton Husband, about the negative effects and feedback and how to overcome them. Sean is a teacher by trade and actor by hobby. He's a K-7 gym teacher, former Peloton husband living in Vancouver. He enjoys acting, teaching, lots of outdoor activities, and staying social with his friends. Sean played the role of the husband in the 2019 holiday commercial for Peloton, an at-home indoor cycling brand. And that video has received millions, I'm telling you, over 5 million views. And at that time, it raged the world. So naturally, we are going to talk about that. Sean, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Gutsy Podcast. Yes, thanks so much for having me. It is my pleasure to be here and chat all about the Peloton controversy with you. <laughs> the Peloton, the great debacle of Peloton 2019. Before we get into all that like juicy nonsense, yeah. I'd love to learn a little bit more about you. So tell me a little bit about your journey. And you're a teacher, you're an actor. Like, What has led you up to where you are currently? Yeah, totally. Wow. I mean... You're right. Like I do live quite a busy lifestyle. I teach full time. I teach gym class at a local elementary school here in Vancouver. I, uh, I'm doing my master's program right now, master's of education, which coincides beautifully. I love the program that I'm doing. Um, I also, as you just said, participate in acting, pursue that as much as I can. Um, I'm enjoying photo shoots as well. Lately, I've been doing a few um, kind of modeling gigs, which has been great. Uh, just a different way of being in front of the lens without all the lines, all the acting. Um, I, uh, yeah, uh, born and raised here in Vancouver. Um, I've only moved away from the city just a few times in my life. Um, I lived in Mexico for a year, which was wonderful. I uh, lived in Victoria. I did my undergrad there. And so I've been a few different places. I'm settled now here in the city. Um, a bunch of my friends live really close by, which is nice. And I'm really trying to establish this is my kind of right, right where I am. This is my foundation. This is my home base now. But who knows where like the next year will bring me. Like I have a few thoughts on where I'm kind of leading to after I finish my master's. I honestly, I wouldn't mind doing another year in a different country. Um, I, I just told you I lived in Mexico for a year and that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I like to take those kind of those risks, those adventures and switch it up, but always having Vancouver as my home base, just like I told you. And so I have a few things I'm looking forward to, but I'm really, I'm quite settled and quite uh, content with where I am now. And so, yeah, just going with the flow, of course, in this crazy wild world that we're living in with kind of <laughs> foot and, you know, uh, elections upon us. And, uh, you know, there, there's so there's a lot to think about. There is always something to think about for sure. Yeah. One thing that I find particularly interesting is that you're a gym teacher, but also an actor. I think so many times people think that they have to choose one or the other. Like you have to choose one career path. You have to choose one thing. What is it like to like balance those two different things? And, and how did you know that it was right for you to, to not choose one item? It's my constant struggle at the same time, having both, because when you don't fully commit to one, you're not committing to the other. So say I chose teaching full-time and pushed kind of acting away and didn't do it again. I do feel like I would honestly be a more committed and more engaged teacher, which I still am, 
I do, I put a lot of energy in what I do every day, Monday to Friday in the gym, but I feel like I would be even more present in the classroom if I wasn't still in the back of my brain, just tickling like, oh, I have an audition next week, or I'm thinking about this that I just saw, and I'm going to do a short film in a few weeks. And, you know, that's always on my mind a little bit, pulls away from teaching and then vice versa. When I'm thinking about uh, acting, it pulls me away um, from teaching and putting my energy into that. So I do dance kind of that line of both. And it is admittedly very difficult just uh, based on time consumption, you know, we only sure. have so many hours in the day. And I just, I mentioned before, I'm doing my master's in education. So going to school, being in school, and then also pursuing that hobby. Um, it's, it's a lot of time and a lot of energy and both are physically very consuming as well. Being a gym teacher, naturally it's in the title. Like I'm up and moving and Adam playing with the kids all the time. And then being, um, in acting, you know, that's very physically demanding as well and very mentally demanding both are. So it's tough. There are a lot of ups and downs with doing all of that, but because I enjoy both so much, that's the drive. Like the internal motivation is there to keep doing both. And so as long as I have this drive and energy to do both, I'll keep at it. I love that you're you're really like playing into your strengths, right? Like, so choosing one or the other, you end up dismissing something that may be calling you, but you know, it's challenging, right? Like, I mean, there's really no way around it, but I think it would almost be more challenging to ignore a part of yourself. Yes. I completely agree with that. And I, I did when I initially started uh, teaching full time, I fully put acting on the back burner and I said, no, this is your full time. Like you have to give it all of your energy. And I did, but it nagged on me. Like it just always like, Sean, you have to maybe after this year, get back into it full time. Or after this year, you have to, you know, you need an agent again. You need to um, get back into acting classes. You need to audition. You need to, because there's a lot of time and pressure in doing that. Um, so I used to teach up in Northern British Columbia. And so that's when I was teaching full, full time and loved that job. Great experience. But that was the problem was it was that, you know, constant, oh, you need to do this. And when there's that voice kind of going on in your head, you have to listen to it because if you don't, you'll suffer exponentially and it'll augment every single year. It'll just keep nagging on you. And that's when you hear those excuses like, oh, like, you know, maybe I'll do it, but I'm really comfortable in where I'm at and I'm making a good amount of money. And so I don't, I don't think I can afford to do that. You, you hear those excuses, but you know, there's something about the initial struggle and that leap of faith. And, you know, sure, acting, there will be times where you don't land a role for a year, two years, and you're putting a lot of money into headshots and classes, and you're not working full time. And the struggle will affect your bank account big time. But the regret, like the regret, you will probably have 10, 15, 20 years. And by then, you might even think it's too late. You know, the that regret is what you don't want. And that's just like a life lesson that I've just read repeatedly of what people look back on in their lives later on in their life, maybe in their seventies, eighties or so what, what's a big regret. It's like not taking that risk. So that's what I tell people. Like you have to, you have to take that risk. It's just so important. Oh, I love it. Risk taking and gutsy go hand in hand. Speaking of acting, I think it's, yeah. I think it's really important and, and empowering to, to talk about aspiring actors or, you know, like there are just certain careers where I feel like it's harder, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's harder to break into. It's harder to make a living at. It's like you have to really like push through a lot of muck to get into that space. Musicians, Mm -hmm. actors, artists, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. What, what are some things that you did, you know, to start really building yourself up as an actor or like what advice do you have for people that, you know, want to pursue something, but it feels so insanely out of reach? Yeah. Acting, I can definitely admit is the hardest thing that I've ever tried to pursue. Um, When I, so I just mentioned I was working up North and teaching full-time. So that brought me um, actually a good little kind of chunk of change that I could sit on for a bit. So I did invest a little bit um, in my bank account. I had $10,000. That's where I, that's where I sat. And I said, you know what, this, 
as long as I move back to the city with a little bit of cheaper rent, um, keep my finances low, I can afford to pursue acting full time for a year as long as I work part time. And so, so I did have a bit of planning to do before I fully jumped in. But with that little cushion, I took that leap of faith and I just dove. So I started auditioning, got my agent full-time, classes full-time. You do have to immerse yourself, but also take care of yourself mentally. So there are a few practices that I've really undertaken to keep my mind at ease. One of those super simple things that everybody has the capability to do is meditation. Like just meditating for 10 minutes a day I did it actually right before this podcast and I just feel, I feel great doing it. It really just, it settles your mind. It settles your body with something really stressful, like acting where you have an audition the next day. Sean, I want you to learn two pages of script and it's for this character and you're auditioning at 9am here at this studio. So you got to figure out how to get there and you might get the audition. Not even, not even now, like mid afternoon, you would get it late in the evening and maybe you had plans maybe you're maybe you're on a date or something maybe you were you know i you you have to cancel things and drop everything you're doing on a whim that is mentally very taxing and so to to uh, settle yourself with a few practices just like meditation just like i mentioned to prepare yourself a little bit financially you do need a bit of a cushion but also be stable in the sense where yeah, I'm going to work weekends. You, you come to this reality where it's, yeah, I'm working Friday, Saturday, maybe Sundays. I won't have a weekend. Um, you do need to commit yourself to opening up weekdays where maybe most of your friends have a nine to five and you won't see them as often. But once you've come to this kind of realization, your friends and you'll get that support from others that will push you in that direction of committing to something hard that's artistic, that maybe isn't as well paying. Um, because you will break through, uh, and I'm a big proponent of effort as well. Um, there's something in, there's something in acting where there is natural talent, of course, and I've seen it in my studio classes before, but you do see a lot of people, the harder they work is you just get better. You do. And it's just through understanding characters, breaking things down. Um, I mean, there's, there's so much more to it than just the lines. And so that's why I really respect a lot of the actors that I know, because it is, it's just so difficult week in, week out, uh, doing things for little to no money, but just you, you see it in their energy, how much they enjoy it. And when somebody finds their, or when somebody has their calling in the back of their head going, Oh, maybe I should just like we were talking about, maybe I'll open a business or maybe I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll be something like a dog walker, which I've never thought of before when they just kind of jump into it jump into that calling that's been kind of itching them. They, you'll feel so much better. Yeah. I, you know, there's something about the consistency you, you yeah. touched on that and it's, you know, it's, it's showing up and doing and showing up and doing. And I think a lot of times a lot where people start to pull out is actually like right before it gets awesome. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, you know, I'm, I, I've experienced it firsthand more times than I probably care to count that like, when shit gets kind of chaotic and Mm -hmm. heightened and hard, it's like, Oh, maybe I'm going the wrong way. But you know, that's where you really have to to pay attention to your intuition and and where you're feeling it in your body. But you want to pull out because that's where it starts to get difficult. But really that's like, that's like the peak of the mountain, right? Like uh, just a few more steps and over, over top, you get to see everything, everything that you've been working for. That's right. You usually have your biggest breakthroughs when you have struggled for, a, a period of time where it's like, I'm not breaking through, like I'm not getting this, I'm not understanding this. And that's the moment. I remember when uh, I was in acting class and my coach gave me a monologue uh, to perform like a few days later on top of a scene that I was already doing. And it was an extremely difficult monologue. And this is a year, I would say about a year into full-time committing to acting. And I w- I'm by no means like that good. And when I was in class, I was like, oh, I was overthinking things. And I thought I had it pretty dialed. And I remember that monologue, the performance, was horrible. It was the worst <laughs> experience I'd ever had. I just, I, I blanked on how I was going to do it. And my coach, she kept stopping me and saying, no, Sean, you're doing a caricature. So there's something in acting like it's called, you're, you're putting, you're faking it. You're faking it till you make it. 
which is not acting. You're, you're just putting <laughs> on a little caricature of what that person, what you think that person is, not what they're actually, not who they actually are. So it could be with regards to anything. So in this, in this scene, I was playing a, somebody who was quite like a frightening human being. And I was, I was doing like a farce of it and it just wasn't real. It wasn't good enough essentially. And she kept stopping me and saying, no, Sean, I need you to do this. I need you to do this. And because I got so much feedback all at once, my mind just went blank and I forgot every line and I had to keep going. And every sentence I said line, because I just went blank and everything that I had initially staged out to do did not work. It went wrong. And she said, no, Sean, I need you to do it this way, this way, this way, right? Because you're, you're getting so much stimulation and there's right. so much pressure in that moment. And 40 people are watching me in my class anyways. I just broke down. Like I had a horrible experience. And by the time I finished it, I was like, I hate acting. Like I don't want to ever do this again. This is the worst. And I remember going backstage and there was one of my friends. She came up to me and she goes, Sean, that was actually pretty good. And I was like, you're kidding. Like, stop. Like, you're, you're like, did you, did you see the meltdown? Like, it was not awesome. <laughs> the point of that, though, she was like, no, that was authentic and real. Like, that was raw and vulnerable. And sure, you forgot the majority of your lines. But what you said actually, like, landed. Like, it hit. And it was effective. And I never thought about it that way before. When you're, like, truly... So that's the whole that's the whole thing of acting. There's no such thing as acting. It's like you're reacting to somebody else, but you're putting in so much time to create an authentic character. So you're just that person. Like you're just, of course you're pretending to be that person, but you need to do such a good job of understanding people that you get to a point of where you become that person. Um, and not to like a dangerous point where it's like, I'm this like crazy insane person now, but it's like, you just understand how to portray that person so well that it's like so truthful. It's like, that was a big moment for me where I was like, no, acting isn't like fake. Like it's not this whole like charade. Sure. We like watch characters on television, but they are putting so much truth into their lines and how they say what they're saying that that's why we love it because it feels real. Like it feels like that person is the vampire or something that's like not actually real. And so I hope that's making sense, but it's, yeah, just, it's perfect. Yeah. It's, it, uh, it does take the time commitment and the realness, the rawness. And so, and that comes with, um, sitting in that space and committing to that space, but also letting yourself take that, drawing it back, um, take that leap of faith where if you're thinking about doing something, just give it a try. Cause you'll never know. It could work out. It could not work out, which is also a good lesson too. And just like we said, when it doesn't work out, when you're struggling through that process of, okay, you know, I'm financially going down. I like, I don't like what's happening right now. I'm not happy for a few different reasons. Pushing through is a really good lesson as well until there is a point of no return where it's like, no, okay, now I need to readjust with regards to business anyways, but it's. Yeah, no, yeah. That, well, this is you know, I'm all about metaphor. So I'm metaphorically, I'm thinking how much acting really kind of aligns with entrepreneurship, right? Yeah. Like, so when you start a business, or whether you're, you know, just brand new, or you're, you know, a couple years into it, there is this sense of like, you have to act the way that you want to receive, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. you, you may not be where you want to be yet, but you have to embody that, that part of you, like, you have to talk like you talk and think like you think and make decisions the way that that person would make decisions that ultimately like magnetizes moving you and your business and your clients in that direction. So, you know, it's just kind of interesting how those things are, are relating. Yeah. I think a big point too, is people want the most authentic version of you as well. So whatever business you're in, like you're in there for a reason. So like if some people bringing it back to like teaching, for example, if some people are just doing teaching for the money, like you can tell, you can tell when teachers are just there getting their paycheck, they're close to retirement. And it's like, no, like I'm unionized. Like I don't, I can't get fired. So I'm going to just like, you know, jump through the hoops until it's my time. Right. You can tell when that is the motivation as opposed to when it's like, no, I'm doing teaching. Cause like 
I love working with kids. And it's like, oh, then you see that motivation. And then you see how it, it benefits the kids in one sense and how it affects the kids in another sense. And so when you, so from a business point of view, when you jump into, so like acting your body is your own business. Like you, you are the business. So it's like you, it, when you take care of yourself for an acting point of view, or when you're looking at opening your own business in a different point of view, and it's something that you're really drawn to want to do, it shows. And, and your customers will go, whoa, like this person loves being here. They love what they do. There's no such thing as time for this person. They're not working a nine to five. They're like ready to answer calls at any time of the day. And they're motivated to like keep, um, keep working hard because it, they don't naturally work hard either. It's just like a part of who they are, if that makes sense too. So it's just, yeah. Oh, like you, so like, here we are right now. Like, you want me to do this podcast? Yeah. Like I'm just naturally motivated to do things like this. Like, it's just something I enjoy as well. And when you can get that like job that you love so much and you enjoy it, like I do with acting and teaching, it doesn't like the time frame doesn't really matter. It does. It is a lot of time doing all of this at once, but it's, I'm happy doing it. And that's the point. That is the entire point. <laughs> that is the entire point. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So let's let's talk pandemic. Because <laughs> that's because yeah. that's a whole thing. I mean, you know, you you came off the the 2019 commercial ride and straight into the chaos of of 2020. So, you know, obviously the pandemic basically shut the world down for a period of time, and and yeah. there's even parts of the world that are still shut down. Yeah. How did the pandemic affect you as a teacher, but also as an actor? Like, how has that affected your life? December last year was just utter chaos. It was crazy. The whole Peloton debacle was going on. And January, it slowed down. And I was like, yeah, I'm ready. 2020, I'm going to audition more. Um, school's going to be like, school's going to go great. I'm still in the middle of my master's program. Like, let's keep the ball rolling. And then they're just like, um, no. <laughs> it's March now, and I have something else to tell you. I'm going to shut down your job. I'm going to shut down auditions. I'm going to shut down everything. And you're just going to have to sit at home and, and just sit with this because I'm not ready for humans to be <laughs> all normal like we have been for however many years. And so I uh, March, April, May uh, was all quarantined. It was at home. Um, for us teachers, we essentially moved our practices online. So for Jim, that was super challenging. I had to figure out how <laughs> to navigate that, which I essentially, I set up a YouTube page for my class, or sorry, for my school. And the kids would log in and I would do like little uh, body break videos for them. Do you know the body break, like Hal and Joanne McLeod? Do you know those? Or I feel like this is a Canadian reference. You probably I don't. I don't. No, let's hear it. <laughs> this, is a, this is a very good Canadian reference. So there's like, so on television in like the 90s, there were these two people, Hal and Joanne McLeod, and they would come on television for like five, 10 minutes and it was called Body Break and do like clutch, like old school exercises, like on television and everybody loved them. They were just little like Canadian heroes. And so um, I made videos like that where it was like five minutes long, we're going to do an exercise routine, you know, running on the spot, jumping jacks, squats, like just exercises for five minutes. And then it's all done. Boom. Easy. And so, uh, that's what I, that's what I was up to over those few months. And it was like, it was so challenging because, uh, filming, lighting, editing, just all the things that go in hand in hand with doing media. It was all new learnings for me uh, that I wasn't used to at all. It worked out. It was good. But still, it was very like, okay, I'm at work, but I'm at home. It was really challenging for um, my relationship with uh, my girlfriend as well. Um, so we were quarantined s separately. And she has a few health conditions, which I couldn't go and visit her at all. And wow. so it was like really, and so that's why the pandemic was really interesting too. I felt like it was a big make or break for a lot of relationships in many different yes. ways. Uh, so many. Can you imagine being with somebody for, let's say you just got like girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, after like a month and it was February. And let's say you like, you just started seeing each other and then boom, like pandemic and maybe you're quarantined together. Like getting to know somebody that intensely, that intimately would be bananas. 
And on the flip side, so for my girlfriend and I, we had been together for a year, I'm trying to think in March. So that was like a year and a half or so. And the pandemic fully just split us apart. Like we were quarantined in two different cities. Like I was in Vancouver. She lives in Port Moody, which is two cities away from me. And we couldn't see each other. We were on FaceTime and like technology has brought us or did keep us connected, but it's just not the same. Like the pandemic really showed me how important face-to-face conversations are and face-to-face connection is. And so that's why like acting couldn't happen. Like acting over Zoom or acting over like doing auditions, it, it was so tough. Uh, the industry was shut down for a long time as well. But um, yeah, my girlfriend and I, we we did end up uh, separating. Like we broke up because it just it was too, uh, we were going in different directions. It just wasn't connective anymore. And so it, you know, okay, great. 2020 pandemic, breakup, environments collapsing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to get into that mindset though as well like you don't want to get into like oh the world's like a disaster and it just keeps getting like keeps snowballing we keep getting worse there is like something to be said for just like keeping positive still a little bit and keeping hope alive and just like no like we need to keep pushing in a way that like makes not only human relationships better but like um our relationship with like the natural world and so many other things um so that we can just progress as a race, like the human race. And so it's, that was a lot to throw at you, but. (laughs) No, it's great. Well, I think that you brought up like a really solid point that I think that probably everyone on the planet can agree with. And it's the pandemic shined light on your relationships. Yes. Whether it's an, you know, whether it's a, a spouse or a boyfriend, girlfriend or friendships or coworkers or bosses or like, everything like everyone I just feel like everyone's true colors kind of cracked open for about three months and so everything became very apparent and I think also in that same sense that everyone's personal values became very strong so you put those two things together and it's like okay where where do I belong who belongs in my inner circle and who do I actually really need to shed yes and that is a very good thing too So like there are some true colors that came out, which were obviously not a good thing, but then your value system as well, where it's like, you know what? Yeah. I don't really need to be friends with this person or this, I don't need to give so much of my time to this anymore. Um, Whether it be like a relationship or just like an activity you were doing or something that just like, you know what, this is like an unhealthy behavior that I do. Like I need to stop doing this. Like there were just a lot of, there was a lot of clarity, I think that came through the pandemic and a lot of kind of good moments because we were able to sit inside for so long and able to reflect. And I think that's something that generally more people need to do is be more reflective and more um, kind of going internal and meditative, you could say, where you kind of just think about your personhood without an ego and just go, no, you know what? Okay, this is who I am. I need to really acknowledge this though. Maybe some bad characteristics about yourself and go, okay, is this something I want to continue doing moving forward? Or is this a place of growth right now where I can kind of shed a few things and it might be difficult. It's hard being vulnerable, of course, and it's hard recognizing things that maybe you don't like about yourself. At the same time, recognizing those things, maybe even writing it down or just saying it out loud um, can lead to a lot of positivity in the long run, which people need to keep remembering is that it won't be like an instant gratifying kind of moment of like, Oh, this is a bad characteristic. Oh, I recognize that. Okay. Now I feel better. It's like, no, Poof, it's gone. <laughs> you'll feel, you'll probably feel pretty shitty about yourself, but at the same time, recognizing certain things will kind of get that off your chest or your shoulders and just be like, no, okay, this is a reality. And, you know, so let's say the pandemic. Yeah. The pandemic's really bad. At the same time, there are places around the world doing some really good things. And um, I was thinking of like New Zealand, for example, right? Where there are other places with um, leadership and other qualities in their citizens that are like, oh, this is something we can look at and learn from. And maybe I live a different lifestyle than people, 
certain people in the world. And it's like, no, but they have like some cool characteristics that I want to kind of bring into my practice in my life. And so being in that reflective state, learning from other people around the world and how certain people do things totally different than we do is like, oh, this is some pretty cool, these are some pretty cool moments that we're having. Yeah, you know, that I think one of the hardest parts, I mean, I don't know that there weren't were any parts that were easy about, you know, when we were all locked down. Yeah. But I think one of the hardest parts is it took away the busyness and it forced people to sit with themselves. Yeah. And so facing yourself, facing your own vulnerabilities, facing your own challenges is, it's not easy, right? It doesn't feel good. You're not like, let me wake up today and, you know, look at all my problems. <laughs> you know, most of the time we cover those things up with, with busyness. So have, you know, being forced to like stop, literally stop everything, Mm -hmm. force people to get really kind of intimate with themselves. And that's, that's a whole thing. Yeah. It's extremely, extremely difficult. And it's just, it's very important to do because I just think of myself as a teacher. Like I personally affect so many kids just in my school setting if I'm in like a grumpy or bad mood I'm going to transfer that energy to like a hundred kids a day and so it's like I do need to be at all times like as best as I can that best version of myself and that's always going to be hard to do as well if like I'm not feeling good where I'm having like a lazy day and just like oh like I don't feel good about I don't know like i ate crappy food yesterday and like I haven't worked out in two weeks like what's going on with me why am I like feeling like this or you know for example like after um my really my relationship ended is like of course we have natural times of just like not feeling good about ourselves and like was that my fault like could I have done something better and I still go through like phases like that like it but that's the point though is to like acknowledge those feelings and like feel those feelings like wholeheartedly and then reflect on those feelings too and go, okay, how can I, um, how can I move forward with this like learning and understanding and like also recognizing that we're all imperfect beings as well, that like everything that we know in this moment will change 10 years from now. And like, we're always just kind of adapting and moving forward and being a better version of ourselves. And so the point is to like fail as well and to like trip and to like, scrape your knees and get dirty and like explore and try things because you won't know until you have tried as well. But then 10 years, 10 years from now, that moment where you tripped and fell, just like I was telling you with the monologue was like a really good learning experience. And so it was a good period of growth too. So it's all very connective in that way. It, it is, you know, and it, it's, it's really just about like staying in the game, you know, it, those things pop up, you know, usually when you least expect it or when it's least convenient. But if you look at all those challenges or you look at those, you know, characteristics of yourself that you're like, oh, maybe I should, you know, this is something that I should not carry on into the next phase of my life. If you give yourself the time to like really just sit in it, feel it, like you said, and, and use it as a tool to grow like that. I mean, literally the possibilities are endless at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also not being like too hard on yourself. Like say you, so like, that's one problem that happens in acting is it's like, damn, like I did another shitty job. Like, why do I keep failing at this? Like we're our own toughest critics. That's the problem is we all get in our head and we all overthink things and we all just go, oh, like I suck at this. Like I hate this. And it's but when you realize that you're your own toughest critic, other people then don't think that way. And it's like, Oh, I don't need to be so hard on myself. And it's, it's always flipping that mindset as well. I bring it back to like, uh, to language where I remember there was a time, um, when I was about to go on stage and I was feeling super, super nervous. And I was like, I'm not going to do a good job. Like you're already in that mode of like failing. Whereas being nervous and being excited is the same emotion as, as long as you put a different name to it. Because when you're excited, you feel the exact same way as you do when you're nervous. Like you're jittery, like you're kind of all over the place. Um, but excitement is a more like positive way of looking at being nervous. And so language is so important in addressing um, 
kind of your own personal thoughts too. So like being negative is much easier than being positive. But if you start to think more positively, then your, your body will react to that. And so reframing language too and saying, yeah, you know what? I think I can try this today. And I think I will, you know, take that. So like I'm thinking of today right now, like I'm feeling pretty tired after a, a long work day, but it's like, no, you know what? I'm going to feel better after I go to the gym. And instead of like, I'm tired, I'm not going to go to the gym. It's like, I, I will feel better after going to the gym. Just like small little like language cues to like, just keep that energy high as well. So I think that's a super important, super important thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm certain that this next topic took an, uh, a tremendous amount of energy and, and yeah. reframing of the mind. So we're going to go right into Peloton. So this is the first gutsy podcast where we have filmed the entire interview. So this is pretty awesome. So yeah. I only felt it necessary to wear my Peloton Sentry shirt because, yeah. you know, I, I'm, I'm an avid rider. I love the brand. Um, I have the bike. I do the app. You know, I'm, I'm in. You know, I spend the $90 on the leggings. I'm that girl. <laughs> yeah. so the bikes are like admittedly super amazing they're like they're freaking phenomenal yeah and we're yeah. Mad, i'm just i'm not wearing the letters like i'm a little I, like i wish i got the memo i, I didn't get the yeah memo. yeah we're i mean we're in the same uniform in spirit <laughs> yeah exactly so if you guys are not familiar peloton is this they launched the bike in you know it's it's at home so it's indoor cycling and they've launched an app and last year they really great gained like a shit ton of traction like they just branding wise and product wise have freaking nailed it i mean they're like on the level of chick-fil-a in my opinion as far as branding Mm -hmm. so they started gaining this traction and they launched a holiday commercial (laughs) so i'm a peloton lover so i follow all the things that they do so this commercial comes out and the first i remember the first time that i saw it my reaction was oh my God, that's so empowering. Like, that's so amazing. Well, (laughs) turns out the world thought something different. So long story short, in the commercial, Sean plays the role of the husband. Sean buys his wife in the commercial a Peloton for Christmas. So she comes out, she's like, you know, has her eyes closed and he presents her this bike and she's over the moon excited. So then she's documenting her her day to day, you know, day one, day five, day 10. And then a year later, she talks about this transformation that she's had. The world coined you as like a sexist pig. (laughs) Tell me, tell me about this. Yeah. freaking situation so we filmed just over a year ago today here in vancouver and it was a two-day shoot and like you described it perfectly like that was exactly what, what the script was going for she comes down i present to her on christmas day this bike super happy she goes through a year-long transformation and we reflect on it a year later boom done and it's like wow that was a good day on set everybody on set was super pleased with how we filmed it and it was all like it was good it was a really positive it was magical (laughs) it was yeah it was great and then i went back to school a few days later i was like bing bing like done here we go back back into my kind of normal lifestyle where's the next audition so i remember when it came out i saw it got a few views and i was like okay cool yeah great this is awesome and then a few thousand then ten thousand hundred thousand and then also like I started noticing like the downvotes as well. And I didn't understand. I was like, oh, okay. It's just people like, you know, not liking a Christmas commercial or whatever. I don't know. Like I was trying to put meaning associated to it. And I didn't quite understand it. And it was then there was like the thousands and then the tens of thousands of downvotes. And I was like, whoa, something's going on here. Like, are people upset at Christmas? Or are people upset at like, (laughs) like, did I do something wrong? And like, I don't really know. And I watched the commercial over and then over and then, somebody told me like, no, people think that, yeah, this is like a very sexist commercial. It's super misogynistic. Like it's the white male giving the, like the, her, or sorry, his um, wife a gift. And like, there's, and it's inappropriate by doing that. And I was just like, oh, that's what people see it as like, oh my goodness. And so my, um, one of my friends in Vancouver, he writes for psychology today and he's doing his PhD here. And he said, Sean, like, can I submit an article about your experience? Like, or your, sorry, your feedback on what, uh, people have thought about the commercial so far. And I said, yeah. 
And so I wrote him like a little 600, like written um, kind of feedback on what had happened so far. And that's what kind of threw it into the mainstream. And then I started getting kind of media calls and I was like, whoa, why are people so interested in this? And it just like kind of, I didn't fully get it, but the reason why I did so many like media calls and interviews was that it helped actually me understand people's perspectives and point of view about why they thought it was so controversial. And that was interesting to me. It was just like, this is like such an interesting little world that I'm diving into. It was a lot of it was curiosity and just like, you want to have an interview about this? Sure. Let's talk about it. And just like, what do you think about it? And so it really, it really brought to eyes, like, how people analyze and break down and something so small, like a, it was 30 seconds, like a 30 second little commercial, how that, how people can have such strong opinions about it. When in my eyes, I thought it was just so harmless. I was like, wait, what? Like you wouldn't want a Peloton for Christmas. Like I would want, <laughs> I want a Peloton for Christmas. Like, come on. And then because, because of this reaction and like, I was getting like, harsh messages like on my Instagram and I was like whoa like this is wow so like I was getting dms where it's like you're a pig like what you're doing is wrong like you shouldn't it, but then it was also because I was doing media as well it's like like your story doesn't like nothing matters here like you're an, you're an asshole like there were just harsh words that like what like being being in acting like gave me this little skin of just being like huh I mean I don't really care about this like inappropriate reflection right now but it's like i'm just curious why you said that like why why did you go out of your way to say that um i did a podcast actually where it was um with dylan Marin conversations with people who hate me and he, <laughs> he got me in a podcast with somebody who said something negative about the um about the commercial and we talked about it and at the end of the commercial or sorry at the end of the podcast he was really nice. He, I mean, he was, an, he's been a nice person the whole time, but it was just like, why do people go out of their way to like say hateful, hurtful things to not only about the commercial, but to the person themselves. It was like, what? Like, I'm just an actor. Like, what didn't, don't we understand this? Like, this is also like a commercial. It's fantasy. Like this, it's a pro it's for the product. Like, I, I don't believe in these, like, I'm not a misogynist. Like what's going on here? Like, it's just like, so many things spiraled out of this commercial and so many conversations happened. And I really enjoyed a lot of the conversations because I was learning so much. I was able to express my thoughts about it. And then who, wh whoever was interviewing me was like helping me get to that point of like, Oh wow. Like this is another perspective. I just didn't understand. And so that, it, and, but then as you know, it just like spiraled and that whole month was like, I traveled to LA and then did interviews in New York. And I was like, just this small town, little Canadian boy, like just traveling the world, talking about Peloton. <laughs> talking, about Peloton. <laughs> talking about Peloton. I mean, it's crazy. And the media, the traction, the like, the light that was shined on Peloton as a brand at that point, I, I can only imagine what, what they were sifting through as well. Mm -hmm. You know, doing all these interviews and listening to all the different perspectives, like, do you see it in a different light now or do you stand true to like the mission of what, of what it was set out to do? No, it's like the way that it came across on screen was exactly like how the script, how I saw the script and like how we filmed the script. And on those days, it was like so true to that story and like the premise we were trying to give that that's why I like never understood the alternative, like approaches to it and the alternative perspectives. I was like, no, but this is what we did. Like, how can you see it that way? I'm literally telling you it was this way. <laughs> and so to just, so the problem was, is people were filling in the gaps. People were seeing gaps in it and going, this is what we think happened. It's like, but no, but that's not actually what the commercial showed you. So like, I think that was an issue was there were so many points that people could kind of fill in and suggest alternative meetings to that just like didn't happen. And that's where it kind of spun out of control. Because it was over, the commercial is over a year, and it's like, oh, he probably forced her to do it every morning. Like he probably, you know, there was so many things that was suggested that just did that ever happen? No. So it's like, where is that information coming from? I find it really interesting too, because like a lot of it comes down to like 
brand as well, right? So, so I'm a I'm a rider. Mm-hmm. So when I saw it, I I knew how long I had waited and worked and like saved up for to buy my bike. Like it was a big deal for, for me. So seeing like to me a husband gifting it to his wife was like, oh my gosh, he knows how much this means to her. Like I'm certain that you know, she had not never heard of it before. And all of a sudden it was just a thing like, you know, so I could, I could feel the backstory, but that, you know, again, that goes into like personal relations and like where you are and how, how involved you are with a certain company or not, you know, it just, Mm -hmm. the perspectives are so interesting to me. Yeah. Because I mean, I, at the time had no like personal attachment to the company. I mean, I was just fortunate enough that the company hired me to do a commercial and that was great. I was like, Oh, look at this bike. Like, this is cool. We're going to sell this product. Okay. I understand what's happening here and we're going to create this commercial. It, and I got to ride the bike and I was like, Oh, this is actually a really nice product, but I can't afford to ride this bike right now. <laughs> and I could only after the commercial afford to buy my girlfriend at the time, uh, the bike, which was a net, that was the statement as, I mean, that was the statement as well. It was just like, you know what? I'm getting so much grief about this. I'm going to send everybody else a message here. And I'll be like, you know what? It is okay to buy your significant other a Peloton bike or any like piece of exercise equipment because it's something that like you can share together. It's something that like they might have even suggested themselves. Like I've been looking to do this, you know, maybe it could be any type of product, but you wouldn't just like gift it and then like force them to like use it it would just be like maybe you asked for it or maybe um this is something we can share together it's just there's just so many yeah I, I i don't know it was my like little statement piece i'm like i'm super proud of that like christmas day post and just being like you know what i bought my girlfriend one and she loves it i, so screw I love that yeah. yeah if you guys don't know sean legitimately bought a bike and legitimately gave it to his girlfriend at the time and put a post up on social media. And I remember seeing that because I started following you after the commercial because, you know, it was a whole big thing. Yeah, yeah. And so when you posted that, I was like, damn, that's gutsy. That, yeah. that is freaking, that's like way to like stick it to the man. <laughs> exactly. Now it's just like, you know what? This is what you want. This is what you get. And so it just, yeah, it, it spun a whole new controversy and wave of just like, media and questions and stuff but i mean just like here right now i'm i'm super happy talking about it and just like the the process for me is always a continuing conversation and dialogue and kind of learning other people's perspectives on it just like your own like hearing your perspective for the first time now is extremely interesting and um helpful for me to kind of just like keep putting pieces together what was the message? Like, what, what is the intent? What is, what is the goal? Like, what is the message that you and, and probably even Peloton would want to stand by with that current, you know, it's still out there. Like it's, it's going to be in the show notes. You guys will be able to click on it super easy, but it's still, it still lives on the internet. So what is the message that you hope that this maybe shifted or changed or the conversation that happened around it? Mm -hmm. This is why I'm so interested in it too, is because it ties so well into my career, like as a gym teacher, like physical exercise is good for everybody and it can look in any way, shape or form. And one of those ways could be riding a stationary bike. And so I didn't even, I didn't even look at it as like the husband giving the wife a bike. And that's like misogynistic. I looked at it as like, here's a present for someone and this is a pretty expensive, like, awesome present. Like, they are going to enjoy a pretty, it. I mean, it's a pretty legit gift. <laughs> yeah. It's like, whoa, this is some serious commitment with this gift. And like, <laughs> but you could tell, like, they had a child together. Like, they were a young couple and their daughter was like five, six years old. So like, they're, you know, happily married. They're doing their thing. And here's like another, like, awesome piece to that puzzle. And so the message is just like, here's how you can exercise through our company, which is at the time, the only thing that Peloton had was just the bike. Now I'm pretty sure they're like a super diverse, like they have yoga classes and they have yoga, meditation and running and walking and all the things. They have a treadmill too. I'm pretty sure now. So there's like, they're diversifying what they can offer as exercise. At the time it was just the bike. So it's like, here's one product. Here's our product 
hence the name Peloton. I mean, Peloton is a biking word as well. Like that means, do you know what Peloton means? Do you know what? Yeah, it's a, it's like a, it's a group. It's, it's a, a group, group of people that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a group of people that, and so the Peloton in a bike race is like the pack of people that are, that are riding. There's usually a few leaders, the Peloton's in the middle, and then there's a few trailers, but that's like the majority of people are the Peloton. And so it's like, what we want the majority of people to know is that exercise is good. And this is the way that we offer it is through the stationary bike, like done period, like end of conversation. It's just like, <laughs> But people didn't pick up on that. There was so much more people thought it was. And so, right. yeah. I think that they, I think they should flip the tables. I'm going to throw this out here, Peloton. You guys, you and the actress should shoot another commercial this holiday. Yeah. But she should give you the tread. Perfect. I'm just saying. And you know what? I'm waiting. I, I would love that. <laughs> I would love a treadmill. That would be fantastic. They're glorious. So downstairs in my house right now, my roommate and I have kind of tricked out our dining room to have like, we have dumbbells, we have a bench, we like have our own little home exercise space. And that's one form of exercise, obviously treadmill, obviously stationary bike. Like there's just other ways to do what we're doing for different purposes. So like, do you want to gain muscle mass or do you want to like, are you getting cardiovascular health? Like there's just different ways of getting exercise, but it all leads to the same thing. Like, that's why I'm such a proponent of being a PE teacher is like being like physically stimulated through any type of exercise just helps with your mental well-being. And then overall, like your energy is just much more settled and it just helps with all of your other everyday functions, whatever you're doing, whether it's like studying or cleaning or like, I don't know, going out for exercise, going out like you have more energy overall. And so working out for me is, is so important. It makes me a better physical educator. If I came home every day and just sat on the couch and watched TV, like I would not be as good as I am now. And so that message is just like, that's, that's what I like to push is like, we need to be physically active in any way, as, as simple as going for a walk. If you've been inside all day, get your butt out, like, I don't care if it's raining, like go for a walk. It's just like, you'll feel so much, you feel so much better. And that's the message is physical exercise gives you such a better feeling of um, accomplishment. And like humans are just bred to be like physical beings. Like we need to move. And so it's that, that's my big takeaway from it. And it, it, yeah, I mean, it just didn't come across as that, but that's what I'm (laughs) feeling about it. Yeah, of course. You know, I I think that you experienced what I think a lot of people are terrified of, and that's other people's opinions. Right. Right. So you you don't want to put yourself out there too far. You don't want to be too yourself. You don't want to be too vulnerable. You don't want to be like, you know, too much because Mm -hmm. what is is he going to say? What is she going to say? What is this person going to say? What if this organization doesn't like me anymore? Like you go through all this rigmarole. Mm-hmm. So you lived that <laughs> pretty intensely for a period of time. Yeah. That stuff's coming at you a hundred miles an hour. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm certain that some of that stuff hurt because you start thinking like, oh, wait, am I, is that me? Like, is that actually how I am? Like, you know, it gets all up in your brain and then it fucks with you. Mm-hmm. So how did you deal with that negativity and, yeah. and also stay true to who you are? Admittedly, like it is, it's super challenging. If you're, constantly getting like negative feedback if you're being told what you're doing is wrong obviously that's going to weigh on your self-esteem it's going to weigh on your thought process and it's going to be hard to overcome that and go okay i'm going to wake up tomorrow and i'm going to be like my usual chipper self like that's difficult it's not something that people so it's not something people like to go through obviously Nobody likes to be told that what they're doing is wrong and you suck and you're acting (laughs) things like that on a daily basis. So how do you overcome that? And that's through like a, a good support system. So like it can be as simple as just like one person or it can be like a family member. Um, It can be, so this, this is what was nice about going through this whole process was people who like really knew me. So I think of my like parents, my acting coach, my uh, acting classmates, my personal friends, people I worked with, 
they supported me and like gave me those reassuring words constantly. And of course that's like super nice and super helpful. So it comes down and it can be as simple as just like one thing. It was my mom, for example, like my mom was like, Sean, this is so crazy. Like you're, you're in this world right now. And like, I'm just so proud of you. Boom. You remember that? Like you just remember that one thing and that energizes you through so many of these like moments of just like, Oh damn, I got this hurtful message again. Like this person like hates me. But what did my mom say? My mom supports me. She knows me. She's raised me. And it's like, that's like a nice way to deflect that like more hurtful message because that person doesn't know you. They don't know your character. They don't know your essence. And so what something as simple as my mom saying that or my dad saying something or I really like I really value and I love and respect my acting coach. She messaged me as well and said like some amazing things. And so I looking at that message and referring to that and seeing her words was like so energizing and reassuring. And so that can be 10%, those reassuring words. And the 90%, just that 10% far outweighs that 90%. When it just comes from a lot of, um, say, messages from people who just, yeah, they just don't know you. They just don't know your essence. And so separating those and reminding yourself that that 10% knows who you are, that's how you get through that. Well, ultimately, those are the relationships that matter. So those DMs from somebody, you know, somewhere in the world, they're probably never going to meet you. They know zero about you other than the 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I think it's easy to give power to that negativity because negativity is more dense than positivity. So it it feels heavier. It weighs heavier. You carry it heavier. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, like, those relationships are not what what make or break you. So it's really up to you to like filter those out and, and really absorb what is, what is true and what is right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, uh, even that person that I did talk to on the other podcast that I was mentioning where we did talk, uh, not in person, but over the phone, um, he brightened up the moment we started chatting, even though he said something hurtful about me, he couldn't directly say it to me. The host had to say it. And he realized the more conversations we had, you know, oh, right. Like this guy is like this, not how I envisioned him like this. And so that is very powerful. The problem is, though, is that does take a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort, of course, getting to know people, um, having a detailed conversation about all these different things, who, who they really are. And uh, that's, I mean, that's why it's important to like right at the start of this podcast, Sean, tell me a little bit about yourself. Give me a little scope of who you are, because that brings to light um, their characteristics and why they've chosen the path that they've gone down instead of, okay, here's one commercial I know him as, this is who he is, right? It's like, that's so fragmented. That's such a like, that yes. line doesn't work at all, right? It does take a lot of effort to get to know somebody in that way where you have such a, you have a, a, at least a, a better well-rounded kind of scope of at least who they are in that, say, like right now, this hour that we're going to talk to each other, right? And so, though, yeah, so again, those, those reassuring words from those people, obviously, that I know really helps um, motivate and drive me through that process. But also, like, I, instead of being nervous, just like we talked about before, I was excited. I was like super excited to after work, do an interview and like talk about it. And like that whole, like being in front of the screen doesn't make me nervous at all. It's, it's a very interesting medium to me. Like I just, it's all based out of curiosity as well. It's just like, I'm, I'm not on TV for like, oh, okay, like he's trying to um, promote himself. Like, I don't have any acting jobs lined up for the next little while. It's more just like, I'm curious to keep this conversation or whatever conversation that you want to talk about going. Like, that's just how you become a better person. Extended dialogue, continuing to talk about things that help you grow and motivate you to keep moving in a direction that you want to go towards. If that makes mm-hmm. sense as well. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Did did all that negative pushback deter you from getting back out there and, and doing more commercials or doing more acting? No, not at all. No, no, no. Because it's like, it's one, 
because I've gotten so much feedback from my acting coach, for example, about stuff that did actually suck. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> like, you, know, you feel and you know when you did put a crappy performance on and you're just like, oh, yeah, damn. Okay, I'm not going to do that again. It's a style of it's a style of learning that I've just like really um, come into where it's like when you feel shitty about what you did on stage, it's like, okay, try not to do that again. And this is what you're going to do better. Like it's always moving in that other direction of one more step forward, three steps back maybe, but one inch forward. And it's like that inch forward just feels so good that those three steps back, like didn't, they didn't matter at all. Even though you might be in a far worse place where you were before. It's like, huh, I feel like I'm getting worse at acting. Like, how does that happen? (laughs) And that happens to a lot of actors is they feel like they're in a space where it's like, I'm getting worse and I don't understand why. But actually, when they are on stage, they're coming off as way better. It's just because a raw, vulnerable state is harder to um, be in for an extended period of time. And it doesn't feel good. So that's why you don't feel like, ah, like I don't feel like I'm getting better, but you feel these feelings and emotions. And it's like, so those DMs, like, I don't feel like I became a better actor from this. I feel like I'm just getting criticized a lot, but those are all like external things that are happening. Like, how did I feel about my performance? I felt fine about it. Like I was in for like three seconds. Like it didn't really matter anyways, but (laughs) I felt good about the conversations. I felt good about um, the media, like contacting me and saying, we have X, Y, Z questions for you. Like what, what are your responses to this? I was like, Oh, that's an interesting question that you have. Let me think about that. Like it just, it was a helpful process for me just expanding my horizon. So, yeah. I think a lot of what I'm taking away from you tonight is just the, just infusing more curiosity into life. Yeah. You know, it, it, it kind of diffuses the situation, it mm-hmm. neutralizes, and it just opens you up to to other perspectives because we're we're humans and we're not always right, right? Like that's just that's, the way that life is. Right. So the curiosity really just it opens you up to other perspectives and you know, you kind of put it in your bank of of thoughts and like, you know, mm-hmm. this is something I'll carry with me for the rest of my life and maybe I've learned something from it. That's right. Like I never really took any of those words personally because it was always, I looked at it and went, why did you just say what you said? Like, (laughs) Why? Why? That doesn't really make sense to me. Instead of going, taking it right as the words are and going, oh, is that true about me? That's not a good question to ask. It was, why Mm. did you say that? I don't get that. Like that, because based on what I know, that's not true. So what, what are you trying to do here? Are you trying to get a rise out of me? Oh, okay. Like, are you trying to, you know, get me to say something that I shouldn't say? It's like, oh, that's why you're trying to maybe make me upset with this hurtful comment. And so understanding that I could never take it personally. Like it just, it, ne- it, that never happened. And so that's why I was able to kind of coast through the experience with that energy and drive to keep, to keep going and to keep talking about it and to keep auditioning afterwards which happened until yeah. the pandemic, of course, said, nah, life is a little better now. <laughs> Just kidding. We have, reroute. We have a new plan. At the end of the commercial, and I, I watched it again, you know, just before we talked. And at the very end of the commercial, she says, a year ago, I didn't realize how much this would change me. Right. <laughs> and I just find that so relatable, yeah. so applicable, so like, so right now. So what would you say the last year has changed in you wow that's a good question my goodness i so i can see that line i can see how that was problematic for people i never realized how much this would change me so people took that so literally as like physically she changed so like this is the point of the peloton is to lose weight and physically look better it's like whoa that's so just like simple that's so 1.0 like it changed her and myself our relationship probably it changed um like her mental state of being like she got into a maybe a good routine of working out at a certain time every day and it just helped her like i don't know in her own real life see now i'm creating i'm creating an understanding right i mean there's 
all, you know, endless, endless endings. <laughs> where, where I was, where I was a year ago was such, holy moly, such a different world. I mean, if I think about a year ago today, yeah, the, the commercial had been done. I would have been just up to my usual things, teaching. There was no pandemic. So everything was normal going out as usual and uh, hugging my friends, which I miss dearly. And, <laughs> yes. You know, simple things like that, that we now super take for granted. Um, this year has taught me a lot about um, just my like external environment, like what's going on in the natural world and how we just as kind of humans need to respond to it. How I can respond to it though, at a personal level, of course, is what I can control around me. But that's a big lesson too, is there are a lot of things outside of me that I can't control. And that's what also we need to remember is that there are going to be a lot of things that just kind of smack you in the face and go, hey, just so you know, here's life. It's going to give you this and it sucks, but there are things that you can't control. And you, if you can come to peace with that, then that's a super, I think a pretty helpful mindset because if it's like, damn, like 28 days of rain straight, which always happens in Vancouver. It's like, it's affecting my mood. But if you let it affect your mood, yeah, like that's going to suck. You just kind of have to keep that reminder that that, that's an external thing that's happening, just like the pandemic. So this past year, obviously, pandemic affected myself, everyone worldwide. Um, I'm very fortunate. I don't personally know anybody who actually got COVID and was really dramatically affected by it. So my circle has been okay, but it just has affected, of course, my job. It has affected my friends' jobs that I know, and it's affected our lifestyle and how we are normally kind of living. Um, at the same time, though, it has really, um, I would say, brought us all to a place of better self-reflection, like we talked about, where we have had a bit more time to kind of let the busyness not be so busy anymore where it's like, sure, I'm still teaching, doing my master's and acting, but I have more time to sit and kind of more time to absorb and really reflect on um, values. Just like we talked about what's important to me, what I need to keep doing to move forward in regards to not just my career, but like what I really want, these big questions, right? Like what I really want out of life. And that's why I brought out um, early on in our conversation. Yeah, I want to live somewhere again for a year because having an otherworldly experience is so important to your development. Seeing people live a different way. I'm really drawn to like either going back to Central South America and experiencing the more Latin culture again, just because it's so different than our North American lifestyle. And especially my like West coast Canadian lifestyle, uh, <laughs> language, music, food, like it's just so diverse and different there. And it's awesome. Like it just makes me a better person absorbing that and being there. And so, um, this past year has, op I mean, I don't have a girlfriend anymore. It just like that whole being single again is really strange. And like, I uh, didn't expect to be single, but obviously our relationship changed through the pandemic and we needed to go separate ways, which is a okay realization to have and just be like, okay, like it's, it sucks and it's sad, but it's like, it needed to, if it needed to happen then okay this could be a growth this is the growth period now right and to not get entrenched in that like oh like i'm a shitty person like it was my fault i broke things you know i broke things up and it was what i did wasn't good enough it's like or it could be a time where she needs some space to have her own growth and being in a relationship wasn't good for her so you can also take that time to like develop a better sense of self and now that time instead of dwelling you could try and I don't know try something new maybe something that a single person could do and it's like uh like taking a risk like living somewhere else right you can't really just do that when you're with a significant other you have to talk about that obviously that that's yes. a big <laughs> whereas as a single person I can just be like well I'm gonna take a plane and go teach over in Japan for a year like that would be awesome I've considered that too and um, so there's, there's new opportunities that have happened over this past year. There are things I didn't want to have happen, but happened. And obviously nobody wanted the pandemic to happen that happened. And it's like, and it's happening. And it's like, 
but there are, I think I have personally grown a lot this last year. It did kind of start with uh, this whole big media exposure. If we just go a year to now, like, so September, October till now, um, that did spawn this whole like, whoa, like what is the next year going to be all about? And um, I'm personally in a pretty good space right now. Um, I am quite busy, but I am growing with still learning a lot through my master's program, learning a lot, being on my own now. And I am actually quite excited to see what more happens. Like I do go very day by day and I don't try and forecast, you know, okay, 2021, here's my big goals. I kind of just like take it slowly as it comes. And at the end of 2021, I will graduate from my program. So that is something that's there, but I, yeah. I, I like the mind space and that the, or sorry, the headspace and the mindset that I'm in right now. So it's good. You know, I think that if anything, 2020 proved that a lot can change in one year. I mean, in all reality, a lot can change in, you know, a week. Like, Let's a be moment. honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a moment. moment. Literally yeah. a moment. Yeah. One day you're at work, the next day everyone's on lockdown. You know, like, so, you know, I just think that that perspective of, even if you're in a tough spot, like this isn't your forever. This is yeah. just a season and a chapter right now. If you're yeah. working towards something great, like that can happen a lot faster than you think that it can. You know, it just, yeah. it puts the, the perspective of time in a really interesting place that that I personally find curious. Mm -hmm. It's perspective and it's also how you respond to it as well. So like you can respond to any situation negatively and you can respond to it in a sense of like, oh, this sucks. Like, I hate this. And it does, it affects you and it affects the people around you. It affects your relationships and how other people view you as well. And so to respond, yeah. So to bring anything and everything into your own perspective, looking at it critically and going, okay, how am I now going to respond to this? Is it going to be positive, negative is a good, so a very reflect that reflective state. I like that word as well, because it just kind of puts you in a sense of pause and gets you thinking a little more rationally, I think about it instead of just like an automatic, like, um, kind of response to, Oh, the pandemic's here. Well, I'm going to freak out and buy toilet paper. It's like, no, <laughs> yes. Like, pause, no. pause. Everyone needs toilet paper. So let's not freak out. And you know, maybe like, we don't know what's necessarily going to happen. But at the same time, though, there's like 8 billion humans here. Like we all need to figure this out together. Like we can't compete with each other all the time. And so that's one thing I learned too, is that like that competitive nature can be healthy in certain things. Sports, it can be healthy. Sports, it can be unhealthy, but it can be like a good like motivator to perform better. But competition, like one human being better than the other is like, ah, we got hold like pump the brake there. Like let's think a little bit more, but let's reflect on this. Right. Don't go out there, go to Costco and buy like a thousand things of toilet paper. Like everyone's got to poop, man. So like, <laughs> you everybody know? has to poop. Everybody needs toilet paper. I don't care who you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's the thing, right? Is even in a, even in a world where there is a lot of unknown, there's still ways we can be compassionate. There's another, there's another word I like too, where it's like, you can be compassionate for your fellow human because they have the same needs that you do at the end of the day. Like we all need our basic needs met. So it's like, okay, we all got to go poop. So they need toilet paper. I do too. I'm not going to buy more than they are. Like that just doesn't make sense. So that's, that's been one that, that learning of just like this last year of through all the busyness, slowing down, being reflective being compassionate, being curious, responding and like listening to your fellow whoever with what they have to say and taking it in critically and not letting it always affect you personally. Those are those are some those are some takeaways. Oh man, some some groundwork for a really freeing and happy life. Yeah, because um, it, it is. It's it is very uh freeing, you could say. It is. That's a great word for it. It is. If you guys are fellow Peloton lovers, you can find me on the leaderboard, Laura Aura. So ride with me. We'll uh, we'll celebrate here together. Sean, as we start to round things out, I am 
my favorite question of all time is always what gutsy means to you. Ooh, what gutsy means to me. Gutsy is very similar. Like the first word that just popped into my head is like brave. So being gutsy is being brave. So like taking a leap is as well, like a, a nice little metaphor. I like, um, just taking that leap of faith. So like if something, Dan, just like we talked about, so like if something's on your mind, if something's kind of tickling your brain, if something's like there that you're itching to do, but you just don't have that, like that you, you're not ready to take that next step. The problem is, is you'll never be ready. Like you just kind of have to do it. So be brave, be gutsy and do it because you won't know otherwise and you'll never be ready for it. Uh, it'll, it'll hurt the longer you wait. It'll just keep like eating away at you. If you want to do something, change a relationship, change your job, change like a small thing, do it, be gutsy and get out there. I love it. I love it. This has been super, amazing very insightful lots of takeaways for sure how do our listeners stay in touch with you how do they find you how do they how do they keep in touch well i'm still on instagram at peloton husbands you know i love i love it (laughs) you know i still accept all dms loving hating whatever i'm i'm always intrigued by what people have to say or what people message me with and i always yeah i always uh post a new photo every now and then of uh, just things that I'm up to or photo shoots I've been a part of. And it's also my way of being in front of the camera and still exploring acting and photography while, while teaching and uh, doing my master's program. So Instagram is the best way at Peloton husband. There he is. Sean, thank you so much. This has been awesome. I've really enjoyed this. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this conversation as well. And, and definitely be sure to, show, to follow Sean. He's, he's awesome on Instagram and super friendly. And, you know, just a reminder that if you want something, just ask, you know, you just show up. I showed up in his DMs one day and I was like, hey, want to be on the podcast and talk about Peloton? He's like, yep. <laughs> so don't be afraid to put yourself out there and ask because the answer might just be yes. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another Gutsy exclusive. We're on to kind of a thing here. Last, The very first Gutsy exclusive was with Marcus Limonis from CNBC's The Prophet, which was freaking mind-blowing. Now we have Peloton Husband, and I've got the next one lined up too. So um, be sure to tune into the GutsyPodcast.com for all previous episodes. And until I see you next time, stay gutsy. Stay gutsy.